Well, welcome everybody and uh, uh, good afternoon and thank you for spending part of your afternoon with us here at the World Affairs Council of Atlanta. Uh, I, we are very excited and I'm very excited also about today's program, uh, which will take us sort of in a slightly different take uh, from our previous uh, program. Today, um, we're talking about why music matters, the entertainment sector, and the path forward for empowering cities through music. It's a story about economic development, which I'm personally very interested in uh, uh, from the Pendleton group that, that, that I belong and through the integration of music to the creative industry. But it's also a story about driving the industry globally, which is something that we at the World Affairs Council are, are very interested in. Uh, it's a story about how about a business, of being a business and how it makes money. And particularly now, this is a very relevant issue, very pertinent to understand how, how the industry works, particularly around the, the pandemics and how it has affected uh, the livelihood if you, of the individual performance. Uh, and so it's a story about resiliency also. Uh, it's, a, it's a story about diplomacy, of the sound, sound diplomacy, as our title says, and it's also about education. So very excited for our guest, and who better to tell us about it, about sound diplomacy that Atlanta's own Tammy Hurt. Uh, Tammy is a driving force for the Atlanta music scene. Her dedication, Dedication is inspiring. You will see it in a, in a short while. She's a musician. She started playing drums at age four and her professional life at 14, amazing. But she's also a producer and this is only the beginning of her, of her life. Uh, uh, she's recorded with multiple uh, legends, music legends. And she was a former president for the Atlanta chapter of the Recording Academy uh, better known as the Grammy. And now she's the currently national vice chair of the Recording Academy. So great experience. She's also the co-founder of the, uh, of the uh, Atlanta uh, um, music partner and the main driver for the Georgia Music Investment Act, the Georgia tax incentives that has made the music uh, industry a beacon for Atlanta. And it's also a crossover for the film industry. Today, she still performs, so she probably was performing this morning or probably performed this afternoon on, on the recording with Sonic Re uh, Rebel. And, and if that is not enough, Tammy is also the managing partner of Atlanta Placement Music, a production studio right here in town. And to help us bring this passion forward, uh, please allow me also to introduce our moderator, who also has had a sterling career. Uh, so we're very fortunate to have her. Uh, Jean Francois, great to have you with us here today. We're one of our own at the World Affairs Council. She's an award winning journalist and media consultant. She's a native of Haiti. She is a former senior producer at CNN International, where she produced news and feature of the Americas, the Middle East, Africa, and Asia, and also in Washington, where she covered national uh, issues and politics for CNN programs such as. Uh, the Situation Room with Wolf uh, Blitzer and many other. Before that, Edvich was the White House producer for Associated Press and conducted lecture for the Inter-American Press Associa Association and the USIA, the former public diplomacy agency for the US uh, government, which kind of plays also to our theme of the World Affairs Council. Edvich began her media career at ABC New York, uh, and we're looking forward to the dynamics of do great stars. So Edvich, take it away. Thank you so much. Thank you, Jorge. Uh, thank you everybody for joining us. Uh, Tammy, uh, thank you especially for uh, being here and sharing in the spirit of music, uh, particularly at, at this time. You've had a storied career as a musician yourself, as a music executive. And I think to tell the story of music, uh, to tell the story of, of music in particular in Atlanta, uh, I, I feel we sort of need to frame this in terms of looking at the industry yesterday as it was 
uh, as it is today, having, having been so changed by COVID-19 and where you see it going forward. And I think people may not know that Atlanta has a music history that's very, very deep going as far back uh, at the height of, of Atlanta's uh, storied music history, uh, the days of L.A. Reid and Babyface and LaFace Records where they came here to Atlanta to establish what was then called uh, the Motown of the South. So talk to us about uh, Atlanta and the variety of music that the city offers and broadly how it has permeated in terms of the, the music movement that is now happening in Georgia. Sure, well, first of all, thank you all very much for having me here today. I'm, I'm thrilled. I feel, uh, I'm, I'm so excited uh, even to be speaking with you and Jorge and the whole team at the, the World Affairs Council. Thank you very much. So, uh, you know, Atlanta is a melting pot. It's, um, you know, everybody talks about there's something in the water here. Um, you know, we have um, such a wide swath of, of types and styles of music that come out of here. And you know, there is, it's indisputable that we are currently the you know, epicenter of hip hop. Um, and hip hop music, of course, uh, black music is the music of our life. It's the music of today and of the culture. Um, but we do have a, a, a long history of um, you know, very diverse genres coming out of here. You, know, you think about um, you know, Atlanta, you think about Georgia, and it's a long, it's a long history uh, of music starting you know, back, um, you know, I, I think of Georgia, you know, uh, uh, Fiddlin' John Carson recorded the first country music album uh, here in Atlanta, in downtown Atlanta, um, and everything in between. Um, you had, you know, obviously the big movement out of Macon with the Allman Brothers and uh, Athens with B-52s and R.E.M., you know, Augusta, you've got uh, uh, Little Richard and Ray Charles, but all of those roads, you know, really have made Atlanta what it is today. And, you know, we were really fortunate, um, you know, back in the 90s to have that, you know, that boom um, with L.A. Reid and Babyface. You had Jermaine Dupree in Dallas, Austin. I mean, you had music creators here who, who came from, you know, from Georgia, from Atlanta, and, you know, really helped put us on the map. And it's just been a, it's been a, a terrific trajectory since then. Where do you think the industry is now? Obviously, the, the world has changed. Uh, since COVID-19 and the imprint of the music, the, the sort of energy that the music has had, the concerts, uh, that ability for people to gather en masse and enjoy music. And we've seen a lot of that transition to virtual concerts, uh, particularly in the spring when, when we were at the height of the pandemic. And it, it seems to be a model that the people have gotten comfortable with, but at the same time, at the same time, Music needs to be a very tactile experience where people interact, they're in the same venue. So, so where is it now from the, his, the rich history you've described to where it is in this moment and, and how you think we turn the corner? Well, uh, it's, it's no secret. I mean, the, the live music business has shuttered um, around the world um, and that's no different here in Atlanta. You know, our big venues, our small venues, um, have you know have ceased to have concerts and about 75 percent of the revenue of most um uh, musicians is made by live performance so um you can imagine uh what it's like to to be a musician in this position right now and and the live streaming was you know it was an innovative way for people to still uh, be able to be in touch with their fans and be able to still perform um you know where we are today is you know fortunately the save our stages act um, kicked in uh, under the CARES Act um, and is a bit of a lifeline, uh, short lifeline, albeit, um, for the, the live music industry. But, you know, I think as we get towards the spring, you know, you'll see exactly what was happening sort of last summer and in the fall um, with, you know, uh, drive-in concerts, uh, concerts in pods at, you know, parks, um, rooftop concerts, um, you know, the, the music industry is innovative and, you know, all the creative industries have this ability to pivot on a dime. It's very dynamic. So I, my guess is you're going to see, you're going to continue to see those live streams, but you're going to start to see, you know, performances, small groups, distanced, and, you know, any possible way to innovate to, for, for performers to get out and connect with their audience and, and continue to make a living. Uh, 
Uh, are you guys there? Edvid, you seem to have been muted. And then maybe you can unmute her. She's not, it's not muted. I just checked, let me see. Uh oh, can you hear me? There you are, now you're oh. back. <laughs> Sorry about could you, that. Could you please repeat that question? Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, at the heart of making music, I mean, music is something that we enjoy, but it's also a business, right? As you've mentioned, there are people who are hurting, suffering, musicians, because of how the industry has changed. And in terms of building back this industry, at least in Georgia, obviously it's something that's a global uh, uh, movement, I guess, to, to sort of get back to what we knew. What is being done here? Uh, how is, for example, the, there's the model of how the music industry has been able to come to Georgia and really create uh, uh, an industry that has exploded. You know, scores of movies are being made here. Uh, the economic benefit to the state, to the city has been tremendous. What do you see in that model that can be scaled for the music industry in order to give it that same vigor that we've seen uh, on the side of the film industry? Well, I think we have to look at the economics of music. So just for instance, um, recent figure that came out, um, you know, for every dollar spent on a ticket at a small venue, there's $12 in economic activity. So that's generated within restaurants and hotels and taxis and retail. So, you know, music, uh, the music ecosystem and the music economy should be thought of as a business. You know, any city that's not investing in music right now is missing out. And I think just as we, you know, we, we all need music. Um, it, you know, we, we've made the case, you know, that sports are good, um, you know, mentally and physically for people. We have to make that same case for music. Because, you know, if we need something, we create systems and structures and policies to facilitate it and protect it and pay for it. So now is the time to be having these conversations because, you know, uh, music is economic development. And, you know, a rich and vibrant music scene, you know, it drives recovery and resilience and creates better cities. And, you know, to your point about the, the intersection of, of um, other media, film, television, uh, video games and music, you know, we have a really great opportunity here in Atlanta to leverage all the wonderful successes um, of those um, different sectors of the entertainment industry to, number one, to help um, the music industry, but also to grow those other industries. So, you know, where there is disruption, there is opportunity. And, and I really believe that right now we have to be having these conversations, not just in Atlanta, but in our cities around the, the country and around the world about the importance and impact of music that it has on culture and, and also on urban development. And specifically, what kind of tax incentives, what kind of numbers are we looking at here in Georgia to be able to, to, to sort of implement this plan to advance music here in Georgia? So um, Georgia Music Partners uh, uh, did a, a survey, uh, economic impact study um, many years ago, but at that time it showed that the music industry in Georgia um, was $3.7 billion and employed about 20,000 people. Um, if you take those numbers and you, you, know, you add them up again against all the sectors um, of, of entertainment, you know, video, the video game business is, is booming here. Uh, you know, everyone knows about our wonderful film incentives, how that's driven business here. But you know, we do have a, a Georgia Music Investment Act, um, which needs a couple of tweaks uh, to be able to work. But what we want to do is incentivize uh, different companies to come in here uh, into Atlanta and into Georgia and utilize the vast talent that we have. You know, we talk a lot about the output of music, you know, and, and we talk a lot about, you know, how much money streaming makes or how much, you know, a, a copyright is worth. But what we really need to focus on is we need to focus on the music creators because that's what creates the ecosystem. Our, our songwriters, our composers, our producers, our engineers, you know, we have to be able to um, uh, provide uh, uh, resources um, to, to be available for those folks coming into the city and the state to do business. And, you know, we have a, we have a great opportunity ahead of us right here. You know, you mentioned streaming, obviously on, on the television side, uh, you look at how Netflix and 
and, and Disney Plus and Peacock and, and HBO Max. There's been an explosion of, of streaming. That industry has boomed. Uh, on, on the music side, with fewer people being in their cars, uh, drive time, the downloads, what is, that, the, what, is the si what is that side of the business? Is it seeing the same sort of resurgence as people are, are, are not in concert venues? Are they availing themselves more with the streaming and downloading of music? And is that offering a bright spot for musicians to recover some of, some of the lost wages? Well, let's talk about this. So the, the vast majority of artists who upload their music will never really accumulate enough fans for streaming to be their main you know, source of income. So if you really think about this in the, in the macro level, 1% of all artists receive 90% of all the revenue from streaming. So that's about 43,000 artists are the, you know, are the artists that are, that are making, actually able to make money from streaming because of the, their large fan bases. Uh, you know, you get paid on streaming per stream, um, uh, 0.000 something or other uh, per stream. So the other 99%, that's around 3 million artists earn the other 10%. So, you know, um, streaming is very good for the top 10% and, you know, the other uh, you know, the other artists have to um, find other ways to make a living with, you know, live music shuttered. Um, you know, you did see the live streams, but, you know, you also make money from merchandise, um, which typically goes hand in hand with, with the live events um, and uh, also uh, licensing. So, you know, it's a tough, it's a tough, it's tough for musicians right now. Um, you see a lot of artists um, selling their catalogs. You know, you have artists who have legacy artists who, probably can't go out and perform and go on tour. They can't go on tour currently at all. Um, and then streaming doesn't really provide them enough of a revenue, revenue stream. So they are, they are selling their catalogs. So you, you'll see that. I'm sure you've seen that in the headlines. And, and uh, you know, it's a, it's a trend. It's a, um, you know, as we move into uh, what the music industry might look like, uh, you know, down the road, um, certainly uh, independent artists know the value of retaining um, your masters. And retaining the the control that you have to be able to um, you know pitch your music for uh, film and TV or you know because you want to make sure that that you've got control of your of your uh, uh, publishing so that you can maximize uh, it, the exploitation and and bring in revenue from that. And do, do you think in light of that is that creating a space for musicians to uh, go at it alone? I mean we've seen that before. When you think about it. <clears throat> a song like Old Town Road, for example, where virtually there was, the musician was able to go straight to the public, to the audience. Is at, at, this, at this time of pandemic, is it creating a space for artists to uh, develop methods that may not be necessarily married to their studios or record labels and, and sort of deliver the music directly and being able to monetize that on their own? Uh, do you think that space now has been created in light of how people are consuming music and how people are making music? Well, I do think that there is a space. I, I think that, you know, especially, you know, artists that already have big fan bases, big audiences, um, certainly have a lot of power. Listen, I think there's still inherent value in, in having a, you know, record label partner. Um, some of those deals may look a little bit different as we move forward, you know, where, you know, masters revert currently by copyright law back to the owners after 35 years. Um, you know, you may see that, you, you may see that negotiated differently. You know, you may see artists hanging on to, to their ownership, but all licensing to the, the labels. Um, you know, again, a great label partner there that is a great, is a great value on the flip side. Um, you know, I look at, there was a, a wonderful model with Access Replay that happened, um, you know, last fall. And Access Replay was a, a gaming um, facility and they pivoted after the pandemic hit. Uh, they uh, developed a partnership with Offset and it was uh, AXR EXP. And what they did was they realized that Offset and his fan base, um, you know, they'll follow him anywhere. So he started doing uh, uh, emerging artist showcases and that streaming, uh, the, they, they would stream the shows on a the 50 person uh, max on a rooftop, stream the performance. And because Offset has such a great fan base, you can sell tickets to your fans directly to watch the stream. So, you know, I think there's a, you know, you look at um, 
you know, Travis Scott and Fortnite. I mean, there are innovative ways that artists are um, generating revenue, but also developing partnerships that we hadn't seen before. Is it is it conceivable to think if in this virtual uh, music platform where essentially the audience is unlimited, right? It's it's anybody who can who can log on. Could it potentially be more lucrative than actual in person events uh, going from a uh, a stadium of 10, 20,000 to, to virtually just about anybody that you can incentivize to pay for virtual concerts. Is, is that a proposition that you see happening? You know, I, I, um, I think you probably have to ask the, the tour accountants, uh, you know, who, who um, uh, oversee the, you know, these mega tours. Um, you know, again, artists make 75% of their living off of live, live events and, and concerts. Um, you know, I can tell you from a, you know, I'm an independent musician and I can tell you that musicians are based on streams and followers and subscribers and likes and all those wonderful things. And all of those things get you exactly zero dollars unless you have a large fan base. Um, I, I think that, you know, live music is an essential component to any artist's career. And, and quite frankly, um, you know, even, at, you know, in working with the Atlanta Symphony Orchestra, hearing some of those, those players, you know, artists are, artists play music for fans. They don't necessarily play to, you know, to just a camera. And that, that exchange of that energy, you know, that it, within a concert venue, within a, a, a small venue, a large venue, and what that means to a fan, I just don't, I, I don't, I can't imagine that you could completely replace your, uh, you know, touring revenue with any sort of live stream. I do want to get to uh, music as diplomacy, music as empowerment and as engagement. And we're a global organization and we may be talking principally about music here in Atlanta and Georgia, but it is a, a, a global enterprise. And as you said at the beginning, it truly is the soundtrack of our lives. What is the role of, of music and diplomacy? How do you see music being diplomacy? What can uh, everybody do uh, in whatever corner of the world they are in to, to really partner with each other as global citizens to, to, uh, to have music be something that really can, can, can uplift everybody? Well, music is a great uniter. Um, it, it's a it's a it's a purple bubble, you know. Music brings people together of every zip code, of of every age group, every generation, and you know I, I think that as we start to talk about you know music as diplomacy, I mean music is for everyone, and you'd be hard pressed I think to find people who don't identify you know something in their in their life with a song with a soundtrack. You know we we. We start our, you know, lives with music. We end our lives with music, and everywhere in between, um, you know, it's essential. So I, I believe that, you know, again, as we start to talk about, um, you know, obviously what's good for the music creator and what's good for the industry, we have to look at how good music ecosystems and the music economy is for a city. Um, I, I think that. You know, if you look at um, uh, Georgia Music Partners uh, organization that I'm a co-founder of, did a, a uh, in partnership with Sound Diplomacy. Uh, for anybody, I'm a, I'm a giant found, uh, Sound Diplomacy fan. Uh, if you all haven't uh, checked out that organization, um, we partnered with Sound Diplomacy to do a study in Fulton County um, to really measure. And again, this is pre-COVID. Um, what you know, what was being generated, what, what type of, you know, monetary generation and total number of jobs were, were happening in Fulton County. And we found that um, Fulton County's output, you know, from, from generating, um, you know, direct in, uh, output was $1.6 billion. And, you know, you're talking about the number of jobs in Fulton County generated by music is 10,000, over 10,000 people. So, also, if you measure these economies, uh, as, as uh, you know, economic folks do, um, you know, Fulton County's ecosystem, music ecosystem grew between 2001 and 2018, 110%. So those are numbers that are very real. They're very tangible. So we know that, that music heals. We know that music brings us together. And it is really powerful. I think we just saw this in our, you know, last election, especially here in Georgia. 
you know, a, a shared commitment towards a common goal is powerful. And as we start to um, really learn the language and what resonates with our policymakers and our lawmakers to be able to be better storytellers about how the impact of music can actually drive, um, you know, drive our, our, our culture. It does drive our culture, how it's good for music education um, and, you know, why we should be investing in it. A couple more questions, Tammy, before we, we open up the chat. I do want to ask you about the, the Grammy uh, Museum uh, pending here in Atlanta. So tell us about that. Yeah, so um, we were able to announce uh, last uh, summer, uh, fall, that um, we do have, uh, we have worked with the Grammy Museum Foundation and have done the due diligence, completed that due diligence to bring a Grammy Museum to Atlanta. And, uh, you know, the idea behind that is to really create a, a collaborative and a unifying entity that ties all aspects of the entertainment industry together. It, it actually would strengthen our position nationally here, you know, in our city or state. And, and around the country because, you know, what we, you know, first and foremost, the Grammy Museum will provide 300 days of music education a year, both inside the walls and outside the walls digitally. So we want to provide access to students across the state, you know, music programs, uh, you know, in the school systems, unfortunately, have been defunded. Um, there, there are lesser and lesser of those, and, and we want you know, we want the programs that we roll out with the Grammy Museum to be in place before we put the first uh, shovel in the ground. So very exciting about that. And, um, you know, a pandemic slows a lot of things down a little bit, but it hasn't really slowed us down. We're determined to, to keep pushing forward and, and we're very, very excited about that. So when we hear the Grammys, uh, everybody thinks about the Grammy show itself and the entertainment, the music, the behind the scenes. So I certainly would be remiss if I did not ask you to give us some fun facts, some behind the scenes uh, about the Grammys, you know, that enterprise. It's, it's you know, it, it will be next month. The broadcast will be next month. Uh, what can you tell us that, that we may not know? Well, I can tell you, it's, it's one of the greatest honors of my <laughs> lifetime to serve as a national officer of the Recording Academy. Um, I think that when people hear um, the, the Grammys, you know, the first thing people think is, wow, you know, Beyonce had nine nominations and then you had um, Roddy Rich and Taylor Swift and Dua Lipa um, with six nominations. And you think about the show, um, you know, on the, sh on the telecast itself, you know, you see these amazing, incredible once in a lifetime performances of these with these great artists. Um, but that's 10 awards. And uh, every, this year we will give out 83 awards. So there's a, a live stream that, that for the other 73 or so uh, uh, awards that's broadcast before the telecast, um, you know, there's over 900 Grammy nominees. So um, you think about like how many people are nominated in those 83 categories, you know, and um, you've got, uh, this year we had over 22,000 submissions, uh, you know, for consideration. And we have 11,000 voters voting on that. So it's the only peer-to-peer -peer award um, that, that, is, uh, that exists. Uh, and um, I, I'm, like I said, I'm, I'm totally grateful to, to, um, uh, to serve the Academy. You know, I, I will say, I think what a lot of people don't know is there's the show, but there's also, you know, the four pillars of, of this wonderful organization that does great work the other 364 days a year. You know, you have um, music advocacy, you've got uh, philanthropy through Music Cares to help musicians in need. Um, you've got music education through the Grammy Museum Foundation, of course. And then, um, you know, membership. You know, we have uh, 20,000 members uh, at the Recording Academy. And so, uh, you know, it's membership in the celebration of excellence is the show. So it's an organization that does good for our music creators and our industry um, all year long. And I, I would be remiss to say, I'm so excited about all of the amazing diversity, equity, and inclusion efforts um, with the Partnership of Color of Change to really be impactful uh, and work hand in hand, you know, to, to help lead the music industry in diversity, equity, and inclusion. And you, you mentioned diversity, equity, and inclusion. It's a conversation that uh, we've been having across the country, across the globe. In particular, what, what is the music industry, uh, you know, doing? How, how is it part of this national conversation, global conversation that we're, we're having? 
Well, I, I think that, you know, we have to do a better job of, of amplifying the work of, of artists and professionals and, you know, genders, races, ages, national origins, you know, sexual orientation. And it's our responsibility to, to call on record labels and management companies and, you know, really all other music businesses to intentionally develop strategies to create equal representation and level the playing field. I think it's incumbent upon all of us you know, uh, not just in music, but globally to, to be doing that. Before we move on to the, to the chat, what gives you hope, Tammy? What, uh, what sustains you uh, with uh, what you do, uh, how, how much you miss music? What word can you leave us with as somebody who's had music in your DNA since you were four years old? Uh, when you reflect, so share that with us. You know, what sustains me um, is playing. I mean, I, I, I am a musician. I have been very fortunate to release new music throughout this pandemic. It has been my, my, my survival medication, <laughs> my, my tool uh, to help, you know, to help, uh, you know, bring us, bring myself, stay focused. And, and, you know, we always have music. I think that, you know, in, in, Considering what music is, again, it's for all of us. And you know, if you're if you're down, if you're blue, if you're happy, and anything in between, put on a song. And and that music is, um, you know, it's at the core of our soul uh, to be able to again help lift us, help unite us, and and help heal us. Wonderful. So I'm going to. Uh start uh, fielding questions from the chat. Uh, we have several questions. People are clearly excited about uh, what you have to say. Uh, this question comes from Keisha Alexander. What prompted your transition from uh, musician to executive? Uh, necessity. <laughs> um, <laughs> you know, at um, uh, uh, you know, some point in time, I was, you know, playing professionally uh, for a living. And, you know, I, I looked, uh, I, I wanted to be close to home. I wanted to, you know, uh, have stability, uh, you know, and, and to, to be able to, to plan uh, things, plan things in my life. Um, you know, it was definitely financial. Uh, that, that would be a good reason. Um, but, um, you know, again, I've, I have, you know, started playing drums at four. I've been playing drums ever since. I never stopped playing. I just stopped, you know, doing it momentarily for, uh, for a living, um, you know, performing. Uh, the next question from uh, the Council General of Belgium. Uh, Tammy, from your privileged position, what would you say worked and didn't from the different initiatives, incentives, regulations taken here in Georgia to expand the music scene? In Belgium, we tend to publicly subsidize the infrastructure studios, uh, stages, etc., combined with cheap cost of living that creates a booming scene, both under, underground and more commercial. So it's that sort of balance between the commercial and, and, um, and, and creating that space of, of cost savings. Um, so I think the question was, you know, what, what has worked and, and what hasn't, um, you know, I think that, um, what has worked is uh, again a, a um, measurement um, to talk about what we have here um, as a commodity, uh, you know, in, in terms of revenue and jobs. Um, I think, you know, as far as uh, incentives, um, we push really hard for the Georgia Music Investment Act. Um, that still needs some tweaks, uh, very similar to our film incentive. Um, took three pieces of legislation to get it where it is. We've had one, so. Um, I think that that could work better. Um, but I also think that, you know, that, that was a statewide initiative. I think, um, you know, I, I would be uh, very interested to speak with the Council of Belgium um, because, you know, the, the funding for the arts um, is a hard, you know, when, when budgets are lower uh, and, and, you know, times are, are tight, um, you know, making the case to fund for the arts, which, you know, uh, our region does, uh, uh, but I think that, you know, there needs to be more of a focus on making sure, again, that we're taking care of, of the creators and we are cultivating that ecosystem and understanding, supporting and encouraging, uh, you know, the, 
the cross collaboration between the different segments of our entertainment community. And also to global cross uh, collaboration as well, because everybody essentially is going through the same thing and, 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 and sharing and in the same uh, music space. Uh, I have a question from Peter. I, I hope I'm not butchering your last name, Karangha. Uh, since entertainment is such an economic engine in Georgia specifically, especially hip hop, is there a lobby that focuses on ensuring that policy incentives and funding is proportionally allocated, especially as artists and labels branch out to other businesses like restaurants, studios, barbershops. Very relevant for our time, clearly, uh, because of that displacement that there's been in the music industry. Yeah, I mean, we have a, um, you know, uh, a Department of Economic Development that does an excellent job. Uh, we also have that here locally with the Metro Chamber. Um, you know, I think that there are, uh, there's a, there's a lot more that can be done as far as a focus on hip hop, you know, the, with Georgia Music Partners, I can tell you um, that again, that organization is for everyone. Um, we would love to have uh, additional collaboration with, um, you know, with artists uh, in the community. Um, but there is a, listen, hip hop is doing, doing really well. And I think that it, you know, certainly um, a more collaborative effort um, to intentionally put some of these, you know, sectors together and connect some of these dots um, is is the way to go. And and I, you know, personally as a as a co-founder of that organization, I look forward to to the the cross more cl cross collaboration. A quick follow to that: What are the sectors uh, that are hurting? If hip hop is doing well and in particular can use more attention uh, to to what they're going through. Well, I, and I say hip hop's doing well. Uh, it's obviously a very successful, um, you know, time in our lives. Uh, you know, hip hop music is music of the world. Um, now I say that uh, that specific genre um, is uh, prevalent in all of our charts and, and, and musicians charting and, and being successful, but that by no means uh, means that, you know, that's, I, I remember those figures that I gave you about the, you know, the 1%. You know, you have emerging artists that need to be supported. We have a studio infrastructure that needs to be supported. Um, and, you know, there is, there is a lot of work to be done. But I think, you know, in a, in a time like this, in a pandemic, what we've seen is we've seen, you know, out of necessity or, or uh, even out of desire, um, a, 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 real, um, a real desire to want to work together. Uh, again, music is a great unifier. And I, I believe that, you know, now more than ever, even, you know, I, I look at um, the Independence uh, Venue Association, uh, National Independent Venue Association, NEVA, um, how quickly they came together in, a, in troubled times. And, you know, it was that collaboration that was able to, you know, push them over the finish line to get funding from the CARES Act on, under the Save Our Stages. So those exact things can be being done in all sectors, but it's going to take, it takes a village. Question from Vicki Hudson. Have you ever had to resist the pressure to play live when you knew it wasn't safe due to the virus? If so, how did you handle that? If not you or, or anybody else, any musician that you may know? I am personally, I'll tell you this, I'm so excited. Um, I've got had a couple of DJs contact me about going out to play and, and doing mashups together. And, you know, that's self, shameless self plug. That's, you know, that's ultimately, you know, what my Project Sonic Rebel will be doing. I'm not going out and doing that. <laughs> okay. I, I, you know, you just, it's just a, um, I feel personally, I have a responsibility to follow the guidelines and, and being in a club with, you know, people that are uh, not masked is uh, not, not anywhere I want to be. What advice would you have for people not currently in the music industry to get more involved in the Grammy Museum's efforts? And it's a question from uh, Francis uh, Busey. Okay. Well, um, you know, uh, the organization that is um, behind the Grammy Museum Atlanta uh, experience is Georgia Music Accord. Um, I encourage you to reach out to us. Uh, you know, we are um, currently, uh, you know, it's still in that due diligence phase of determining a, um, uh, a location. And, you know, I think we'll be off to the races once, uh, you know, once that's confirmed, we're, we're looking at, a, at a, a few different options, but um, contact us at Georgia Music Accord. Um, I'm available online just about everywhere. So uh, happy to, to speak to anybody who wants to help roll up their sleeves and, and help us make it a reality. One question, you know, I didn't ask earlier, uh, Tammy, is 
what kind of music do you expect musicians will be making? How will this time inform uh, the next soundtrack of our lives? Again, we started off by talking about um, Atlanta being a melting pot, and, and I didn't do a good enough job, I don't think, of, of talking about, you know, this wide swath of, of, of genres and music that come out of the city. We have a 27-time Grammy award-winning symphony orchestra in the Atlanta Symphony Orchestra. It's, it's a, they're an incredible organization, so you're going to hear more of that. We've got you know, um, our, our artists, uh, country artists, you know, Sugarland and Christian Bush and Brandon Bush and um, Zach Brown Band with John Hopkins and Clay Cook. Like, you know, you're going to, I would guess, to, I, I would, I'm going to venture to say you're going to have a lot of really great music coming out because people are, are, are stuck. Um, you know, you can do, if you, if you do the quarantines and the bubbles, you can go into the studio as long as you're distancing. So I think there's probably a lot of great music that's, that's going to come out of, of this. And, and I'm just, you know, from Georgia, um, you know, I'm excited to see the depth and the breadth of, of all the styles that come out of here, because, you know, that's what makes us so unique. You know, you've got, you know, certain sectors, you've got, you know, uh, Nashville, you know, it's primarily has been known a long time for country music. Um, you know, you've got LA and New York, but Atlanta and Georgia, there's something again, there's something in the water here that that makes this, you know, this this great natural resource that we have, you know, the greatest cultural export of our of our state um, is music. And it's it's that wide swath and, and the you know, varying degrees of, of all genres. One last question as we begin to wrap up. Uh, and this is an important question. It's it, everybody is going through this in, in their own way. How do you reopen? How 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 do you move on uh, safely? I work for a renowned theater in Atlanta. What more can we do to make our theaters and concert venues more safe as customers return post COVID? You know that's a great question, and um, I. Uh, I look to our, our friends in the live sector, you know, uh, Josh Antonucci with Rival Entertainment, you know, they're, they're, they're examining this, you know, he and Lucy are examining this very thing every day with, you know, the, the folks at Live Nation and it's, it's the $64,000 question. Um, what's it going to look like, you know, fortunately between, you know, in the position that I have with um, the Academy, I've been able to have a lot of uh, conversation, uh, conversations with uh, you know, the RIAA and different, you know, AEG or Live Nation about how reopening is going to happen. You have to understand that, you know, even with distancing, um, you're adding costs to events. So, so you're going to add an additional at least 30% in COVID um, compliance and, and, you know, uh, different configurations of uh, festival fields or, or seating. Um, so you have, you know, I think the greatest um, challenge is going to be making that, you know, being able to break even or or make money um, for venues and for promoters. Um, you know, what can we all do? You know, from my personal, um, uh, you know, standpoint, you know, get a vaccine uh, when it's available. And you know, we're talking. You know, you watch every day about the news coming out about herd immunity. Is it happening? You know, we're going to have to still stay masked and take good care of each other. Um, and, you know, go ahead and, and buy those tickets to that festival. Go ahead and, you know, pay for those live streams or get those guitar lessons, like support your music people. And, um, you know, we're going to make it through this. There will be another side, but, you know, we, we, we're in survival mode, innovation mode, I suppose. Um, you know, support, support music people however you can. Before I turn it over to Ambassador Charles Shapiro, I, I just want to say thank you so much. And I think you're ending this conversation on the right note by saying to take care of each other, which is so important. Uh, thank you, Tammy. This has been an incredible conversation. I feel like I could have kept going talking to you about this because music is indeed the soundtrack of all our lives and is so important. Uh, Charles, uh, I turn it over to you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Tammy. I want to thank you so much. I mean, there's something in the water. I think we've all drunk it. And the question is, you know, how do we turn, you know, have that where everybody's feeding off each other and helping and growing. Um, I think it's indicative that uh, Mary Waters, who is the Deputy Commissioner for International Trade of the State of Georgia, is on the this call today. 
Um, and it's, in, <clears throat> pardon me, it's indicative of how important the music industry is for Georgia, that the uh, com commissioner of trade is, is on with us, taking, taking notes just like the rest of us. Mm -hmm. And Vish, you have been terrific. You, you can have my job as the moderator anytime. <laughs> you are great. Um, I got to, um, this program will go up on YouTube, our YouTube channel, the World Affairs Council YouTube channel later this afternoon. Uh, if you want to watch it again, and particularly if you want to share the link with you think with people whom you think would be interested. And uh, y'all, please subscribe to our YouTube channel. And once you've done that, join the World Affairs Council if you're not a member. Um, we need your help. I need your help. Um, for three more days, we've got a triple donation match to the World Affairs Council. $25 becomes $75, thousand becomes $3,000. Um, our directors have offered to, to match and I, I don't want to give any money back to them. Don't want to leave money on the table. So y'all please help me out. We've got a program a week from today, Thursday, February 2nd for our under 35 members for our young leaders. And it is just a very informal conversation with me talking about what's going on in the world, including we're going to talk about this. So I want to thank you again, Jorge Fernandez for organizing. Edvi Jean-Francois for being a tremendous moderator. Tammy Hurt, this has just been great. I, I, I've learned so much about so many things today. Uh, I want to thank Fernanda Lucchini, our executive director, and Valerie Lopez de Frank, the producer of this program. And I will see y'all all next third, if you're under 35, next <laughs> Thursday, next Thursday evening at uh, I think 530. So thank you all. This has been great. Bye -bye. Thank you very much. Thank you.